This is Spencer from the MacGuffin. Today I'm joined by cast and crew behind Operation Avalanche, which is, is it the premiere here at South by Southwest or is it played already? Actually, we've just played at Sundance okay, before so this, so this is our, sec our so second screening. Pretty close, though, um, uh, which essentially is a... Let's say documentary about the moon landing. Uh, oh, sure. Well, yeah, that's a, it's yeah. a fake documentary, yeah. but sure. Uh, why, why spoil it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so what exactly was the genesis of this idea for you guys? Because it's, I mean, it's a very clever premise and very well executed. Uh, what made you sort of decide to make this movie? It actually came from our first feature, The Dirties, which we, we made in 2013. And it was a fake documentary about a school shooting um, that w what we thought was so interesting about that movie is a very small film. But the audience, you never knew watching it if the characters were joking or not. And because it played that game with the audience, we realized, oh, this format, the fake documentary format, is actually kind of a new place to put audiences in for, for watching fiction films. Um, I mean, fake documentaries are made all the time, but rarely is it with like a, a narrative story taking place in the real world. That doesn't yeah, happen so only, often. And not only that, but it's based, depending on who you ask, in some sort of like actual reality. I mean, yeah, exactly. depending on who you ask, people believe that the moon landing was fake. Oh yeah, there's a huge contingency of Americans, and I think even people around the world who are extremely dubious about, about the Apollo program. Now we went into this fully, fully, fully believing that the moon landing was real. Like, I mean, we, we, that's not, the point of this movie wasn't to convince people. And we people. came out the other side yeah, thinking no, the same like, thing. We could totally fake this. <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, you know what? Oddly, I think I am more, I'm more on the side of, yeah, you could have filmed this. Um, but I know too much about, like, the technical limitations of video technology during the 1960s that make it impossible. Like, there's no way that that footage that you watched was shot anywhere except for the moon. It's just not possible. Uh, on, only because they would have needed to have shot it on film. Like, we go into this in the movie. Right, right, like, you, have, you would have had to have shot it on film and then d done a transfer to 15 frames a second on video. And that just <laughs> doesn't hold up because the film would have so many artifacts right, on it. Yeah, yeah. It would have scratches and dust. Like, you would need... An, uh, like an absolute dustless lab that was able to transfer, you know, 20,000 feet of film. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. If there's anyone who could probably have it, the government might be the Yeah, one maybe. Who That's true. That's true. But or I think Kubrick. it may have, been, may have been less work, I think, to just send some dudes up there in a, in a bottle rocket. Uh, but, it, I mean, to answer your, your question specifically, there was a lot of tricks that we learned on that first movie, like a lot of tricks, and we wanted to do them again, except in a bigger space. So that, that brings up a good question, and that was sort of recreating this world of the 60s on you know, an indie film budget. I mean, you guys did an amazing job in sort of recreating and making this story, which easily, I can imagine, be like a 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar film to sort of create. If so, you did it narratively, like like if a straight it, movie, it, yeah. Still, like, I mean, it, it could be very easy to sort of create a lot of the stuff, like maintaining the period authenticity, creating these sets, the different locations. What was it like actually trying to feasibly do this without maybe all the resources in the world at your disposal to do it? Well, sometimes it was helpful. So like when we had to sneak into NASA or when we had to sneak into Shepparton, then I actually think we gained from it. I actually think us doing that, that real mission to actually sneak into real NASA and film this for real, that was very powerful because we got so much narratively from that. And if we just had $20 million and we could have built NASA yeah. then and we could have hired all the staff, I actually think that's a worse movie. I think that's a much worse movie than what we did, which is go film with the real people, really be undercover, and really be scared, and have our characters resonate with the real, the real us. So I think that although that that was a cost-saving technique, I actually think it made the film better. Um, but then in other instances, I think we were really hitting our heads against the wall, like trying to shoot that car chase, trying to shoot that sequence with Stanley Kubrick. But, but even all that stuff too, like it it helped to influence the creative choices. So like in that car chase, you know, it's, it's in a field in the middle of nowhere. And because it's in a field in the middle of nowhere, we didn't have to worry about all these other period vehicles or period storefronts or yeah. period costumes on extras. Um, and we could control it a lot more. So on one hand, it's a huge cheat, but what it actually led to was like, oh, Matt needs a safe place. Matt needs a place that's isolated and far away. Why is he out here? Oh he's burying this film. So mm -hmm. it, it helped to 
because our production model is so back and forth between the means of production and the creative, um, as long as those two are malleable and willing to influence one another, and we like when that happens. So again, that, I think that created a strong narrative choice, which was, oh, let's establish Matt in this field, burying this film, this paranoia seeping in. Um, and I think that that worked really well. And then um, we were grad students at the time at our film school in Toronto, York University, which was a film school built in the 60s. They had all the old gear, all the old cameras. Um, so we just had free access to this stuff that otherwise, I think... It, anybody else trying to get this stuff they would have spent like tens of thousands of dollars even just to get those like the cameras that we use the lenses that we use like all the old techie like the Steenbecks like what I cut the movie on like that it's uh, it's not cheap you could probably find that stuff for free if, if like with film schools were getting rid of it but if you actively went out to try to gather every single one of the artifacts that you see in our movie Pretty you, you all you spend a million dollars easily what was it like in terms of keeping things, you know, relatively historically accurate. Did you guys do a lot of research to sort of make sure that, you know, like, oh, this is a plausible scenario? You know, I mean, obviously I'm not like a 1960s expert, so it played pretty well for me, but it seems like there's a lot of sort of details put in to sort of make it feel appropriate for Well, we cared. We, we, we definitely cared. A lot. I mean, veracity is big for us, especially with movies where you're lying about everything. It's important to have things that are really the truth. But the, the good news is about a conspiracy is that, like, well, one, there really was no conspiracy to fake the moon landing. So there aren't a lot of, you know, scholars who are going to say, no, 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 that didn't really happen because, I mean, the whole story is... is I bet is, you could find some people. I, she, I, I believe you. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know that we would call them scholars. Yeah. No, yeah. sure. Oh, come on. I think that's a worthy pursuit. Time researching, I'm yes, sure. that's fair. And so we, we did our best to follow that moon landing conspiracy as, close as, as closely as we could. And there is no one unified vision of this is how the moon landing was faked. What we did was we tried to take the best of the best. So, like... Th things like how the photographs were ma manipulated, we try to recreate that exactly the way that people say it was done. The thing about Stanley Kubrick, we tried to, we didn't want we Stanley Kubrick. touched upon, so it sort of would explain where yeah. the origin of that. And, and our timeline is also extremely accurate, um, which, which I think is actually what lends credibility to a lot of the conspiracy, which is one, one of the big things people point to is that James Webb retired for no reason, out of nowhere, right before they went to the moon. Which doesn't even, there is no justification for that, almost no matter how you look at it. Something personally may have been happening to him, and that's why he retired. It's but still suspicious. Extremely so. And so we make that a central part of our movie. We have James Webb retire right after the CIA says, you need to get the yeah. fuck out of the way, otherwise you're going to get killed. And so he does. And that is a real press conference that he held to announce that he was retiring. And so we use it right in the exact timeline of where it happened. And so I'd say in terms of historical accuracy, that's where we had to be careful, where, you know, I mean, Apollo 11 happens after Apollo 10, happens after right. Apollo 9. Like, we needed to follow that timeline extremely well. James Webb retires this day. You know, the, the, it, all these things happen in order, and so we couldn't break that. But I doubt that people will even go through the film dissecting it for how we followed the years and months. But we did. So that, that, that was hard, but I don't even think people will pay attention to that. Yeah, and then there were like little things that happen, I think, anytime you're making a period film where little inaccuracies that we would try to, to correct. Our, our special effects supervisor, Tristan Serafa, was like really uh, anal about those things. He would, would replace he, he would buildings. Like buildings. He's like, that building was erected <laughs> in 71. And well, the plane that like I fly that. in, we had, to, we had to be very careful that plane was built in like 1967 or something like that. Um, okay, so the film Operation Avalanche, what is the plan for it getting out there? Is there a place people should go to check it out when it's available for them? Uh, yeah, well, it's being released by Lionsgate in North America, and we don't know exactly when it's coming out yet. We imagine sometime in the summer. We hope that it's coming out uh, at around the anniversary of the moon landing. Okay, so, uh, and it's, website for it or anything, or Twitter? Or we have a Twitter handle, I think it's Op Avalanche. Okay. And a Facebook page. Yeah, but with no website yet. No website yet. Okay. So follow that. I'm sure IMDb, Lions Data, et cetera, will all update uh, that. Yeah, you'll be able to find it. If you just type Operation Avalanche, there's also a like a bunch of real military operations with that name, but you'll find it. You'll get that. Very cool. Well, congrats on the film, Guy. I can't wait to see what uh, happens for it when it comes out, and I can't wait to see what you guys do next. You well, got it. Thanks thanks nice meeting you, man. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight.
Like, don't even try to buy the side style. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.